Hello, my name is Jay Chauhan. I'm a mentor in the Angel Mentorship Group. And uh, we have in this group uh, launched about 20 lawyers and about five paralegals. And the objective in our group is to try to support the lawyers, especially those who are launching and those who want to learn the areas of practice which they can utilize for the purpose of uh, helping to make decisions in their practice, which is very often not shown in the admission course or in the university degrees. So today's program is on the subject of launching a legal practice. So I just want to explain briefly my view why the launching of the legal practice and the ability to do it and the information you need to understand what is it that you need to do to launch your practice is extremely important today more than ever before. And I just want to explain to you why. Number one, there has been a corona in the last roughly two years time and in which time the number of jobs that could be obtained are, are minimized. So there aren't too many jobs. But at the same time, in the year 2022, we roughly have about 2,200 graduates and new calls to the bar, and many will not be able to find employment, and they will need to decide if they can practice on their own or not. And this seminar is intended to assist those who want to start their own practice, and we want to give practical support to those who want to, to start uh, the practice of their own. So in, uh, in my background, very briefly, is uh, I'm a lawyer called to the bar in three jurisdictions, uh, which is England, India, and Ontario. And uh, I've also been a deputy judge for 24 years in this jurisdiction in, in uh, Ontario. And I'm also a writer, wrote a novel called Love in the Empire. And the reason for my writing the novel is to explain the challenges that many immigrant lawyers go through in terms of achieving their career in this jurisdiction. So this lecture is intended to assist those who want to launch their own practice. And then I will cover a number of issues that are important to think about in terms of launching your own practice. So starting with the first question, now you call the bar, what do you do next? And the first question that you have to be able to answer is finding a location where you can practice. So this also means that can you not start a practice from home? But the problem of starting a practice from home is um, that uh, people are used to, uh, people in, especially in Canada are used to the idea that they see a legal office, they see your certificates, they see a reception and uh, there is an atmosphere of a, a place where you go and meet the lawyer and that makes a, an impression in the mind of the client. And if you meet at home, it, uh, the atmosphere is casual, more informal, and does not make the same impression. So I would recommend that if you want to create an image of being a lawyer and having a location from where you operate, and then you separate this from your home, that is a good idea. Toward the end of this lecture, I will try to also indicate that if you do not have a place where you can go to, then we in the Angel Mentorship Group will also assist you to find a location. And I'll give a background of how we can do that. But I think my first point is that you should have an office where you can work from and have basic facilities to work with. So here's the next issue. What are the issues what are the equipment items that you need to launch a practice apart from the space? So you need a place where you can have uh, your computer and uh, a modem, the facility for fax, uh, emailing system, and a cell phone, which are the, the basics of what you will need in terms of the equipment. 
just going through the background of the history of the evolution of the profession, even in this province, there was a time when uh, we had secretaries. So when I was called to the bar, more well, than uh, you know, 40 years ago, we had the staff at that time. So there was a secretary, receptionist, and uh, equipment through which you dictated your letters and gave instructions to the staff. And each secretary specialized in a certain area of law. In the last about 25 to 30 years, the whole profession of secretaries has more or less disappeared because the computers have taken over the function of recording the information in terms of what you, you want to write. And in the earlier years, there were word processors but the computers took over the word processing functions as well. And the most popular program today is the Microsoft Word. Prior to that one, there was a program called Word Perfect. So all these programs enabled you to memorize the basic documentation in, and you can use this basic documentation to create new documents with. So what I recommend is that you create right from the beginning of your practice, a catalog of all the precedents in different areas of law that you practice. As you gather your experience in different areas, you try to collect more precedents from that uh, new area of law. So I used to keep two sets of precedents actually. Well, one is the file itself that goes on the computer with the letters you've written, but also you remove the names and create a precedent of the documents that are basic to what you have done. For example, you make an application for probate, then it is a good idea to have completed forms downloaded from the website and, uh, and memorized so that you see not only the form, but also how these forms are, are filled in and utilized in a, an actual application. Because the rules of procedure practice, uh, you will also get some of the precedents uh, given to you either from the website or in your studies, but it is not straightforward when you try to make decisions as to which particular form will apply and how to use it and what information goes in it. So having a form ready to complete is very helpful. So I think to give the best example of that is the small claims court forms. These are all forms that are now available online. And if you have a printed book, of rules of procedure, you see these forms in the back of the, the procedure because they're regulated by the rules um, regulations and they're available to be used. But if you go directly into the form, there will be lots of questions as to how the ending happens, how the backing happens, a number of things that are not easily uh, seen in the regulation. So I do recommend that you create a catalog of the precedents that you can use. Now, if you're new and do not have the precedents and want to utilize the precedents from my system, which I've collected over many years, then you're welcome to do so if you're a member of the group. So I think that uh, in terms of the starting your practice, if you have the first client come in there and you want to deal with the client to prepare, for example, a will, you need a, a will precedent. You need to be able to figure out actually how you'll print it, you need a printer. So coming back to the equipment portion of what you need to do is that you need a computer with a printer and you need also the emailing facility on the computer because most of the communications you know, is, is connected to the email today. Email has taken over the mailing and post office system. But that does not mean that you do not need a mailing system because many of the uh, institutions still will rely on mailing and many of the rules of procedure also require that uh, the letter is sent and some of the documents are still served in, in the traditional manner by having those documents delivered to your office in a printed format. But the means of communication has now become prim primarily the emailing system. Now, when I launched the practice uh, more than 40 years ago, the primary system communication was uh, 
a mailing system in which you wrote an envelope, you wrote a letter in it, you had a letterhead, you sealed the envelope, you had a postage system, and you put the mail in the mailbox, and uh, the people got it at the other end in about two, three days, the reply back, you got the reply back. But all of it is now changed essentially by the emailing system where you have instant communication and you can send copies of your emails to several people at the same time. This also raises the question of privacy. When you have several people that you're sending the email to, um, it creates a problem of what is it that you can send to whom. Now in Corona period, a lot of these issues came up that if you're dealing with the opposing lawyer and you have to deal with the question of whether you send the copy of the letter to the client, then the question also arises whether you send a copy of the letter to the opposing lawyer's client as well. So this debate is still going on and some lawyers are comfortable with it, some lawyers are not. But the traditional approach of a lawyer in the adversarial system was that the lawyer dealt with another lawyer and they face the brunt of the procedure and sheltered the client from the manner in which the legal system was conducted, namely the communications, the pleadings, et cetera. So some lawyers are comfortable from the rules of the service client privilege to keep the communication only between their own selves and the, and the lawyer and the opposite party may wish to do the same thing. And then when you talk lawyer to lawyer, then some people are comfortable, some lawyers are comfortable, some lawyers are not. My own preference is to keep it very open because if you're not using tactics and procedures to, in, a, in a sort of, you know, with integrity, then if you're assured in your mind that you've taken the reasonable position and if even if you disagree with the other party, in my view, you will obtain a consensus much better in the adversarial environment if you're able and have the atmosphere with the opposing lawyer to try to disclose what you're saying to the other party so the other party is able to understand what the lawyer is thinking, what his client is thinking, and what is the area in which you can find a consensus. But you should not try to use in the email system a communication that is directed to the opposing party's client. So the rules of ethics require that when you communicate, you only communicate to the lawyer who represents that client and not with the client directly. And uh, so I think that uh, there's a comment that I should make on the technology today, that uh, the technology is changing the rules of how the lawyers function in the legal environment. So to sum up again, the equipment required is the computer, the printing facility, the fax, the email, then the cell phone and the, and the um, printing facility for a printer. Now, some of the printers are also scanners as well. So what my experience is that uh, when a letter comes by mail and you want to scan it, then you should have a scanner facility to scan the document and store them in, in appropriate places. And then you are able to uh, find them more quickly. So the whole filing system is changing. All my years or decades of experience in terms of filing system is now changing quite uh, dramatically in terms of storage arrangement. And traditionally, each file had a, a physical kind of system of putting the documents in a bread keeping the pleading separately, creating a folder with the uh, name of the file. And, and then if it was real estate, that you also had uh, the checklist on the top of the folder to indicate the different things that you need to do and to remind you what you need to do to ensure that all the searches are conducted, et cetera. So we kept different kinds of folders with different colors to identify the area of practice that you were doing so that you can trace the folder quickly. And, and I arranged the folders all in alphabetical format. 
so that uh, you can find the file of the client in, in a physical format in a filing cabinet. So you, one of the things that you also need is a filing cabinet. And now currently what I'm doing is uh, using the computer and the storage on the Google Drive and keeping the documents with the name of a client and storing these the other documents such as evidence in a separate subfolder, which is much more convenient. So the way you store the documents now, that if they came by email, you keep it in the subfolder where you can find it. And when you need it, you can print it on a printer and use the, the printed format to carry out the, the function of uh, reading it or dealing with the client or giving it to the other party or mailing it or whatever. So now, there is much better and different facility for the purpose of uh, storage of the documents in the computer. So in terms of the, the method of communication today, I should also emphasize that one of the key things that you need in technology today to function is the modem. So you need a modem, which if you're in a home, the modem will connect with your home phone, or connect with your TV and also connect with your home computer as well. So in my case, I carry a computer home and a computer at office so that the traditional carrying of the briefcase that you take a briefcase at home and from home to the office is really no longer necessary because all the documents that you have can now be put on a, on a drive, which are what they call cloud drives. And from the cloud drive, you can access them on your cell phone you can access them also in the office, same document in the office. You can uh, open it. And then we have in the office also a screen where it can, the client can also see the document on the screen if required. So all these modern facilities are possible in the modern technology and improves the ability of you to work with the technology in the modern situation, which is the year uh, 2022. I won't go too much into the future technology, but I just quickly mentioned that uh, the technology is also moving in the direction of artificial intelligence. There are two companies now um, that I'm aware of that are actually producing the entire set of documents and litigation uh, in an uh, automated format. What I had done in the 1980s when the computers came along is I created the precedents and teaching memos for Seneca College in which the documents were kept, kept ready, except for the names and the variables such as dates. And, um, and then when you needed them, you fill out the dates and complete the, the documents with the information that you need. And the computer programs are now much more sophisticated and they can insert the dates automatically. But this automatic insertion of the dates and the variables is going to move in a different, in a much different direction by the artificial intelligence, which is capable of identifying the information that you provide, merge it automatically in the right place with the blanks that you left in the documentation and put it all together in, in the ready-made document format and give you the end result in the printer format that you want. So I think these programs are not fully developed, but they're being developed almost on a daily basis. And I, uh, I urge you to try to keep on top of it so that it will enhance your ability as a small practitioner to have the wherewithal to do uh, things that can help you compete with the other law firms that are more established and have the experience of dealing with the documentation and the forms that you need to complete in the, in the technological system that we have today. So uh, having talked about the equipment, they also mentioned to you the use of the precedents to be kept on the computer. So from the next step or forwards, that once you're equipped to deal with it, I should have also mentioned that you need a telephone system also that uh, can, can ring and, and you give the answer because all the clients are still not used to the idea, but the new generation is more used to the idea that you can talk directly on the cell phone. And there are many systems today that you can get in which you can have your regular telephone line uh, connected directly to your phone as well. 
And we have that facility also introduced in our office so that if you're not in the office and want to hear the phone, the phone is forwarded to your cell phone. But in, a, in, in terms of your creating the image and the ability, it is important that the lawyer has the ability and the technology and the equipment to be available to the client in the technology client is uh, able to function with. And that's the most important arrangement. So this criteria, what you need is not stagnant, they're changing. And as of today, I described to you the equipment that you may be needing to launch your practice. Now, I think that when you have all this equipment, there's a certain amount of cost to buy each of these items that you that I mentioned. And uh, what we're doing in our mentorship group is that those who do not have the resources to have all the facilities, including the modem, the scanner, the printing facility, we help provide those facilities to the members and with a modest rent so that they can uh, use the facility and launch the practice much more effectively without having to, to buy all the equipment all at one time. But when you in the long run want to do your own office, it's very important that you're aware that each of these facilities are necessary to function in the legal environment of uh, today. So once you have the equipment, um, and of course your desk and the furniture are a part of it, and location where you are located and the space that you need to function and see the clients is all physically necessary um, for the purpose of uh, launching a practice. So once your physical facilities and equipment are ready, the next step is waiting for the client to come. Now, this is the biggest challenge in my view that is happening today, because all the studies that uh, you will see, um, including your, your JD degree or NCA qualification or by admission course does not prepare you for the marketing of the practice. So I just wanna give you a few words to understand the legal profession. The legal profession, unlike the medical profession, is an arrangement of private delivery of legal service from lawyers that the citizen pays to get the service provided. In my opinion, it is uh, become very, very expensive because there are a certain amount of, uh, in my view, impediments in terms of using the private enterprise system, but the society does not have the resources except for legal aid uh, which covers only certain areas of law. And for all the people that are, uh, for example, in the landlord tenant situation, the family situation or criminal law situation, who can have a legal aid lawyer. And the legal aid lawyers are also people usually that are young and, and learning the area of law, do not have necessarily experience. But those who have the experience like me, and have a, you know, charge you $500 an hour, it is very expensive for the people to get that experience which you need. And very often the client wants that level of experience so that you can have mature decisions. You can, you can have the reputation of being trusted, knowledgeable before a client will commit their file to you. And therefore you have to develop that over time period, that, that level of image of integrity, supportiveness, and the knowledge that is required to the community. Now, how do you create that knowledge and connection with the client is your marketing challenge. So if you go back to about 30, 40 years ago, what happened at that time was that the means of communicating with the client was, was a challenge because if you were in a local community, people got to know you, you had a network, you printed your name in a newspaper, you made an announcement that you are a lawyer now and launching a practice. And the rules of the advertising are very carefully governed by the law society in the rules of professional conduct in which your advertising has to be in good taste, et cetera. But what has changed fundamentally in this traditional method of printing your ad and giving it in the newspaper and writing your name in the phone book, in the yellow pages and the white pages, is that now you have a very different arena of marketing that you can use for the purpose of reaching your clients. Now, the method 
for using the the computer systems and the modern communication system today to market your practice so is what I broadly call social media. So I just want to touch upon a few of the social media um, types of arrangements that you can use to market your legal practice. One of them is, for example, the Facebook, which is very popular. Quite a few people around the world now are members uh, of the Facebook. You need an identity and you have your image also in the Facebook and you have different means of uh, writing what you want to say, record it if you like, write an article, but on the whole, it is something that is much more social and does not necessarily create a, a very professional image that you might need to show uh, what you do and what is it that you like to practice, but it does open up an, an arrangement for you to, to even do a page which can be utilized as like a website to try to show your image, your name, and your interest, and then be able to get across to the community who you are. The use of the social media has increased very dramatically since the corona period, and Facebook still remains the traditional social connection mechanism through which people are connecting with each other. If you use it carefully, you can gain substantial audience using the Facebook itself. And we have members in our group who have succeeded quite well in terms of using it very effectively. There are many other uh, um, systems to identify which peoples and groups would you like to connect with where you can find the clients and where can you do it in good taste so that you appear like a lawyer and not a person simply selling your services on a, on a kind of a standard of uh, simply, you know, which, which is not necessarily acceptable to the law society or does not create good taste in the image that you create to the public. So very important that you do not use the Facebook like a regular person to create the image that you need to create to, to, to show that you're a lawyer responsible and be able to carry out the client file that the client has given to you. Just another example that uh, came up after Facebook was a program called LinkedIn. Now LinkedIn has many more lawyers and uh, and many of the universities and the law professors and the law groups also have presence in the LinkedIn um, program. Now I would, and I have a, a section, a J John mentorship group in the LinkedIn as well in the last few years. And uh, there I saw that there is a place to write articles as well. So I've written out uh, quite a few articles there in the LinkedIn and I keep it there so that uh, people that want to get to know me or my thoughts in different subjects, then they can get and see the articles. I think that uh, before this uh, social media, broadly speaking, that enabled you to write articles and, and show to the public your, your connection and your knowledge and your interest in certain areas of law, um, there were magazines where you can also put your name across. I wrote many articles in the York region and in the Richmond Hill, Newmarket, Vaughan and the Markham areas, but they are not being printed right now because of Corona period. But I think in terms of the LinkedIn, it's an electronic media and you can post the article and you can use a link on your front page of the LinkedIn for the purpose of bringing attention to the audience, to the article that you want to write. I do recommend to our group that you learn to express yourself in the verbal sense, like this program presented to the, to the public and our group. Um, and you also practice how to write. These two skills are very fundamental in the legal profession because the clients need to know that you can verbalize your message, both verbally and in written. And, and my comment to you is, that uh, even if you write the pleadings, it does not necessarily give you the same ability to market your practice like an ad. But if you put an advertisement in a magazine, and there are, for example, certain communities that are community magazines, and you put an ad in that community, 
some communities will respond to you in, uh, in it, by connecting with you in your language group. That is where they basically connect because they feel affinity in the language. But very often, if you limit yourself to only to the language group that you belong to, you might not have the lawyers in that group that will match the skill that you need to compete in the legal environment. So I think in terms of using the, the way social media, you should be very aware of the type of image that you're creating in social media, but also aware how each social media that you are using is also used very effectively. I'll give you just a couple of examples actually. If you are looking to have a presence in the social media, the first thing you need is a website. A website is very important because it starts with a www, then whatever you name you want to put in there, at the end .com or .ca, and that gives you a basic image that people can look up. Then you can write about your law firm and what you do, your specialties, and give it the different headings on the top of that social media what is it that uh, different things can be done uh, in terms of the connection with the client? For example, in my case, what I have is my, my name, www.jchohan.com. I have a page for clients in which I try to give some information on a certain area of law by letting the client know that, for, for example, if you're preparing a will, what is it that you need to know? So that in the first meeting, traditionally, you had a meeting to tell the client that, okay, can you think of your executor? Can you think of the beneficiary? And uh, so on. So all that discussion that you normally had, in my view, using the website can be minimized, but you should never, using the precedence or the standardized forms of communication with the client, use them to customize the situation for a particular client. So um, I have also got, for example, a checklist, a ready-made checklist for each area of law that I am practicing in on my website in which I show that, for example, if there is a will, you read the memo of several pages of the issues that you should think about. But after the issues have been thought out, you need to write out uh, the decisions that you make, for example, the name of an executor, the name of the beneficiary, and so on. So once you have that uh, checklist completed, then it's given to you or sent to you, you prepare the document required, then you arrange a meeting for the client to sign. So that's in a very nutshell, the kind of arrangement that in the modern system, you're able to communicate with the client and then save the time that is needed for the purpose of, uh, of uh, communicating with the client on decision-making and then the advantage of having it in the written form is that they also form the, the instructions to you so that uh, if there was any question marks later on on your liability or the negligence, you're able to show to the client that he did give instructions to that effect and therefore you did what you did based on what you did, he dedicated to you. So I think broadly speaking, that was a chapter with respect to the social media and the in the marketing arrangement in the context of today, which is the year 2022. Uh, the next big area of concern for a new lawyer is the ability to make decisions. So I will just say a few words as to how the JD program, the NCA arrangement for foreign, uh, for foreign uh, students to, to come to Ontario and how the degree programs which are academic. So before 1957, the Law Society controlled both the degree program and the bar admission course. But now, of course, in the last many years and decades, that uh, that they are separated, and the Law Society arranged for York University to have the Osgood Hall, which was sort of created uh, on the Queen Street uh, and started as a as a body in 1896. And until 1957, that the Law Society controlled both the academic and the practical education of the lawyer. But today, the York University does the JD program. There are many students who go to foreign countries 
And one of the impediments in Ontario is in, or in Canada is that you have to do an LSAT examination. The LSAT is an examination that is requires you to understand a whole concept of the uh, items in English and then be able to understand it in a very quickly and, and in the language, be able to use the summary of it and show the ability in LSAT that you can comprehend the language at a very sophisticated level. So if you're not born in, and raised in a family with the English language, it is one of the challenges you have to go through. But my message to our group first and other people also listening to the lecture is, that if we have to function in the English language, you have to function with other lawyers, the courts, the judges, and in the pleadings in the English language, predominantly in, in Ontario, and if you're in Quebec in French, but you must have that language command completely at your disposal so that you do not uh, show any compromise that would uh, show to the client that you cannot represent the client properly in the court system through the use of the language. So I think those people in our group who would like to use the language and like to learn how to use the English language properly, I'll be happy to assist them in that regard as well. And I'd like you to know that there is no training and the presumption in the examinations in the NCA or the JD is that you are totally fluent in the examination. Very often the accent becomes a problem. Those who brought up in a different language and they have to worry about trying to be audible or heard in the, lang in, in the accent, which is a different one as you do it in, uh, in, in the courtroom and in, in with the client in this country. And so my view is that if you are uh, brought up in a language, but bring it to the English language to function you must be fluent in your original language if you want the clients in that language, but fluent in English as well to write as well as to express yourself and have the ability to express yourself fully in the language so that there is no question marks in your mind. And, uh, and I say, I speak several languages myself, about four. And in each language, when you, when you are perfecting that language, um, I make sure that the person on the other side is very comfortable listening to the pace of the language, the word that you use, and they are comfortable hearing you. And the same thing applies in English so that there should be no compromise. But if you have to go into the courtroom and be able to speak, the judge should not have to, to strain themselves figuring out what is it that you're saying and make it difficult, which will affect the way he makes the decision as well, because he's not gonna say it to you, that I didn't follow your accent. So you just have to make sure that you have taken enough trouble to make sure that the language in which you're expressing yourself, Minnish English, is fluently expressed so that the judge does not have any problem trying to understand what you're saying. And I've been a deputy judge for 24 years myself. And I, I think in the initial years, I was very sympathetic with other people not speaking the language properly. But what happens in my observation in the real practice in the courtroom as well, is that there is not sufficient time and the pressure of time to make a decision and hear the parties out and to make a decision is so intense that if there was a problem uh, with the language or with the witness and he doesn't have an interpreter, then you are more likely to simply hear the parties that, that are able to express themselves properly and they get the edge way and uh, and, your, and the support from the judge. It doesn't appear fair, but you have to make and bend over backwards to make sure if you're a judge that you hear out both the parties with without interpreter. And if you are the lawyer, you must absolutely express yourself correctly to make sure that uh, your expression is understood by the judge properly. So I, I made this comment actually because the number, we have in our group alone, roughly 10 languages in our group alone. So we want to be able to illustrate uh, in the Angel Mentorship Group that we have the ability to speak more or less these 10 languages to the clients, but each one of us should be prepared, ready to, to perform in the, in the function as a lawyer, or meaning a barrister or a solicitor fully 
so that there is no compromise in the way you draft your pleadings and uh, in the way you present your particular opening statement, you do the cross-examination, examination in chief in, in the absolutely um, flawless manner. So anybody who wants those training, we will do that separately. I'm working with several lawyers currently where we are showing those skills and training the lawyers in that skill. Now, most important thing to recognize is that in the JD program and the NCA program, or even the bar admission notes, there is simply insufficient amount of time. And some of the, the gaps that are there in the education process are quite large, actually. To give you just one example is um, the, the student is not taught how to do the marketing. The students are simply not explained, actually, that you're in a private enterprise business. The rules of professional conduct are designed to say to the lawyer that he will behave correctly in relationship to the tribunal, to the lawyer on the opposite side, to the court, etc. But the fact that you must get your client yourself and be able to show your ability to the client that you can bring his argument to the courtroom and succeed in competing with the other lawyer, and that he must pay for it is missing. The fact that you must uh, ask the client that this is the amount of the fees, this is your hourly rate, and this is your, your cause of action, your right retainer, so that in the training program, there is ample amount of material to how to write a retainer, ample amount of professional responsibility being explained, actually, that you are responsible in different ways to protect your client's interest, not engaged in anything that would show that you're compromising your your with your opponent in the adversarial interest that he represents with his client and how you to engage in the resolution of the problem and how does it in practice work to deal with your client asking for the fees compete with the other lawyer and make enough money to survive and pay for your office pay for yourself and your your personal living is simply not explained so that is the reason why we want this in the mentorship group, this educational part to be fully explained to the lawyers. And it is my view that uh, all these things, if done properly, that there is a potential for you to be able to succeed in your, in your practice quite well. Because I think uh, in Canada, there is a certain amount of, of uh, fairness and ability that is, uh, cap you know, it is capable of being exercised for each person. And the challenge is that you have already spent, uh, let's say, 10 years of your career to just go to university, but then there is uh, resources. So there is no very little education that to launch the practice, there is more resources needed and much more in terms of the knowledge or even the cost of equipment and the rental space, et cetera, to make it possible for you to launch the practice. How, how much does it cost? And what do you do to achieve all, all those things is simply not uh, given. So that's why we have the mentorship group in which we want to support you in this regard. And so anybody interested can join our group on the Facebook or connect with us and we'll be happy to assist you. So I think just summarizing that uh, when you start the practice, there's a lot of theoretical knowledge that is provided both in the JD program as well as in the, in the bar admission co course. And these programs, although bar admission course is intended to be practical in decision-making, it is insufficient to really make the decisions with. So most graduates who come out uh, currently have two major, I can say impediments or drawbacks actually. So they are very, um, we have those people in our group that even after being called to the bar and being insured, they're very concerned about making a decision. They're worried that they would make the right decision. And uh, that worry makes it difficult. They feel insecure. And therefore, uh, in that situation, what do you do? So I think the mentorship group uh, or the mentorship program as a whole is very helpful for younger lawyers to have a mentor who can support them and show them how to make the decision and carry out the decision that they are making on a particular client that they've got. So I think that um, 
that's something that is not taught in the schools, but is very, very helpful to have that support. So if you go to a large firm, the senior lawyers will provide that function, but in a very formalized way, the emphasis is in the big law firm that in the article period, they will give a certain amount of training and bigger firms have better facility for training you in different areas of law. But the focus in even in articling period in the big law firms is not necessarily the learning process of decision making, but rather carrying out whatever standardized work you can produce for the big law firm. So this makes it very difficult even in articling in Ontario to have the skill to make the decisions in different areas of law. Now, if you article downtown and you start to launch a practice in a, in, a, in a suburban area, you will still have the other challenges that we mentioned in terms of knowing how to manage your office, in terms of the decision-making process in different areas that you didn't deal with in articling, and collecting your precedents, having uh, all the other arrangements to, to launch your particular practice. But if you take all these situations into account, the way you have to think in your financial terms is that after you invest the money in equipment, rent or whatever, that how long does it take you? Most students have not thought out in their minds that the real cost of launching the practice is when you start the practice, not just paying the fees to do the exams one at a time, and those costs are, are there. But when you launch a practice, the cost of uh, rental, for example, so to give you an idea, suppose you rent space for about $700 or $800 a, a space that you can use, and you have no client, and you're waiting, your rent does not stop because you don't have a client. So you've got, let's say, one year of rent is about nine, $10,000 of expense. It goes out of the window whether you've got a client or not. So you have to do the whole thing of getting the client, making decisions, understanding how to make the decisions all put together without the training on that issue given to you to launch the practice. So I think that is very important that uh, you recognize that if you don't have the training and you want us to assist you, we will. So I think the other part of the understanding that I want to bring across in this uh, seminar is that uh, there are typical areas of law because of the way the education program is structured in Ontario and in other jurisdictions as well. I'm a member of three bars, England, India, and Canada. And in each bar, there's a different arrangement, actually. You know, so I'm, I'm not, I'm generalizing, but, but a lot of the decision, the problems happen in different areas in a similar manner. Because all, the, all of the jurisdictions, including England and India, for example, have the similar problems in terms of what training and how they provide to make it possible for the person to launch their practice. So one of the problems is that in Ontario, a typical lawyer will end up doing certain areas of law, which are easier to get into. I just want to explain some of the areas of law. One of them is family law, one is criminal law, and a bigger one is real estate, and then immigration. So in, in these areas of law, are typically practiced by majority of the lawyers coming to this jurisdiction from outside. Now, if you, be, if you go in a large firm, then you have a better chance of learning the skills in areas of law where the remuneration and the payment by the client is better. So I just want to review a few areas of law which are productive financially, and we want to teach that areas of law to those who are interested, and they include the areas of corporate law, state law, trademarks, and bigger litigation. So let me just explain actually, how does it work? And why do the lawyers who start new practice not able to do corporate law? Just to give an example of corporate law alone, the challenge there is that many in my group as well have not even seen a minute book in the time they were studying. So when you present the minute book to a student or a lawyer, it may be the first time that they even see a minute book. So when you write a resolution of a company, it does not write like a letter. It's not even, even how to write a letter is never shown actually, but I was recently dealing with one lawyer and I was very surprised that she had got a very good presentation of how to write a letter. You write the date on it, write the re part, 
dear sir, madam, etc. And what are the, the ethical codes in which you address, uh, for example, a woman? Is it the miss or miss, missus, ms, or um, how do you say something to somebody? And do you write your last name? Do you write your first name? And what is the ethics of the law profession in Ontario is never explained in the, in the studies. Now, the same thing applies to the corporate law. How do you write a resolution is never explained, actually. For example, on the top, you write the name of the company. Now, this is a resolution of directors or resolution of shareholders. So you have to know, and the admission notes will tell you, or the, the Business Corporations Act, which you learn in the JD program, will tell you that there are certain things that the lawyer can do, oh, sorry, the directors can do, certain things the shareholder can do. But these are not taught from the perspective of problem the way it will come to you. They're taught from the perspective of a section in the law that simply says the directors have the authority to prepare a share certificate, for example. They have authority to approve the financial statement prepared by the accountant. But how do you express it in the format of the resolution is most of the time the, the, client, the students not have seen it. So that makes it difficult for a student to, to start to do a resolution first time around. And since there is no practical training system except for mentorship group programs, so then I was at one of them in Ontario, where we show the resolution with minute book and explain, and then you are able to prepare the resolutions and you do one or two and you become aware actually that how the resolutions are expressed in the corporate law. But the corporate law presents another problem uh, in terms of uh, the tax law. If you change shares from uh, one person to the other, you have to worry about the tax law. The tax law is taught separately from the corporate law in all of the programs. And therefore, if you have to make a decision for one file, you not only have to have the principles accounting, which are taught separately, how to look at the minute book, and then how to deal with the, um, the tax issue in the transaction. And these are definitely taught, but when you do the file, you must do it all at one time. Now, if you learn the skill properly and some co corporate law firms will teach you if you're articling there, then those who are not articling there, they do not have the exposure to the corporate law, but the corporate law gives better income because in the long run, the, the fees that they pay are deductible for their taxes, so they're more liberal in paying the fees. But the fact that you can get better clients and be better paid the corporate law is never in terms of teaching system explained to the students. Uh, similarly, in the state practice, um, what happens is that the, the fees are much better in the state practice, but large number of young people do not get the exposure or ability to, to deal with the question of state law because that uh, the clients very often in, uh, in, the, in the initial years are, are younger people and the younger people get young people also coming to them as clients and are and the people who can develop a couple, uh, the state practice are much older, and therefore you miss out on that the area of law if you're launching a practice and have no law firm to belong to, no system by which you can encourage people to come to you to do the state work, which has much better fees than, for example, real estate. And real estate, for example, if you look at the averages, is the lowest paid kind of subcategory of the practice area in Ontario, but I would estimate there's something like 40, 50% of the Ontario lawyers, and especially the smaller firms are doing real estate practice. There are certain areas such as uh, trademarks, which have a totally different regime in terms of how they are actually um, practice. There's a registration system for a trademark in, in Ottawa, and then if you prove that you have a trademark, you can show the registration system, which is a long process by itself. So there are people who specialize in registration, those who specialize in, uh, in litigation of trademarks, et cetera. But if you learn those areas of law, then they're paid far better because they become specialties. So I think in litigation is another example. With litigation, there is a whole set of people now doing litigation in the in the area of small claims court, and you compete now there in the with the paralegals, 
And uh, if you're a lawyer, you don't want to compete with the paralegals because they only have two years education and the fees are much more than the lawyer's fees. And in the market that we have, the people would rather pay the least amount of fees rather than get the best expertise from a lawyer. And therefore, the lawyer's role should be to try to get litigation at a much higher level. The bigger the amount, more the client is interested to, to get the results in the court with an experienced lawyer who understands the tactics, understands the procedures, and is more comfortable with the system. But in a younger lawyer, is, they may find it very difficult to get bigger clients in litigation area. But if you do, that's a very good area to be in to practice. But just to summarize, that when you start a practice, the biggest question is what area of law do you practice? Because there's so much law to learn that you end up specializing some, some amount um, of law, which is comfortable and, and easy for you to get clients with. And therefore, it is very, very important to think out. A lot of the people that I've talked to end up being you know, doing solicitor work, which is <clears throat> convincing type of work. And I think a lot of the, if you do only one area of law, do not take sufficient interest in other areas of law, you will see that the law areas of law sometimes converge on other decision making when you have to make decisions in a, in a set of facts which are. Uh, uh, related to each other. For example, a client comes for real estate, but says, okay, can you do a will? And you don't, you know, so if you have figured that out very well, then it is easier to, to do the second area of law. But very often, if you do not know the areas of law, you will be disadvantaged. I have gone through one particular, for example, a dispute on a shareholder's agreement in a corporate law, where the law on the other side was not familiar with litigation, and I had the benefit of knowing both areas of law, and I was able to succeed in, in, that, in that situation. And the other party changed the laws three times and they didn't succeed because each, each lawyer was only specialized in uh, one area of law at a time, but had very little understanding of another area of law. And that limits that lawyer from making decisions which can be helpful to the client. The most uh, Typical situation where this happens is family law. Very often a family law file begins with a policeman coming because somebody hit somebody in the family and that one lawyer will represent the client on the criminal law, another one will do the family law and you paying two sets of fees. So this is an, a very good example to understand actually that you can be specialized, but if you're not familiar with another area of law and you keep your mind shut about learning new areas of law, then you'd have to deal with a situation where you cannot coordinate the areas of law for decision-making for the benefit of the client. So how do you do all those things? The one of them is to make sure that when you start a practice and you begin to, to, to learn different areas of law, you should constantly keep your mind open and learning different areas of law. Too many lawyers in Ontario get specialized at the early stage exhausted for, with, from learning, but have not kept an open mind. And, and they just uh, try to get updated only in the area of law they're practicing, but not aware fully of what is happening in other areas of law. So a very important tool that you need is a supportive group where you can pick up many ideas from the other areas of law if you belong to a mentorship group. And that's why we have this mentorship group to make you sensitive that even if you're not practicing one area of law, that you have the ability to understand issues that are being solved in other areas of, of law. Now, one, a couple of more things, then we wrap up this particular lecture. And that is, what is the, the uh, networking arrangement and what is, how does the manager mentorship group work? You need a network in the law to, I think, a large number, to give an Ontario example, roughly, 80% of the profession works in a middle size or a smaller size law firms. So, but the large firms, which are dominant mostly in Toronto, have about 20% of the legal groups or lawyers, uh, but they dominate the legal market 
and the large number of people who graduate and who must compete in the marketplace have to do it in suburbs in smaller practices. So your ability to have the specialty, the, the competence, the, the, and the, the chance to compete with them must be developed with a supportive group, which can be a mentorship group or a collaborative group, associate group, whatever you call it, but you need a grouping system through which you can do it. But because you're in a competition model of the profession, this grouping arrangement becomes very difficult. So we offer in, in the engine mentorship group a, a facility or arrangement through which people can come together, share their experiences. And with my experience of uh, quite a few decades now in Ontario, I'm supporting a number of lawyers in a number of areas of how to launch a practice and how to learn a specialty and then uh, support them as they launch the practice. So I think that uh, I hope that this uh, lecture was helpful to you. And if you need to join the group, the engine mentorship group, you can join the Facebook or connect with us and work actively and help us do the CPD programs. And if you have any question that interests you, we will not only answer the question, but we'll also support you in terms of the understanding of the thing from the theory and the practice point of view. If anybody is interested even in renting the space, we have arrangement to rent the space at a modest amount so that you can use that space to launch your practice with, and then you can uh, connect with other people at the same time and be and integrate in, in the legal profession. So, um, so I want to conclude it by saying that, uh, well, thank you for attending this lecture and I hope that was helpful and uh, hope you join the program as well. Thank you.